Hello, my beautimous art sluts. This is Allison Moon, and you're listening to Artgasm. On today's episode, which is episode number 10, yes, I have done 10 of these so far, and we have so many more in the future, my guest on this episode is Janet Marie Rogers. Janet is a First Nations Mohawk Tuscarora writer from the Ontario Six Nations. She was Victoria's Poet Laureate for three years, and we talk about a lot of awesome, interesting things. We talk about Indigenous erotica, we talk about performance poetry, we talk about colonial and identity and sexuality, and we talk about the horrifyingly timely issue of residential schools. Um, a lot of people in the United States don't actually know about this incredibly recent thing that a uh, colonialism did that white people did to indigenous people which was to take their children away from them and put them in schools in residential schools and try to quote unquote de-indian the indian uh, this is a thing that living human beings remember very well this is a very present issue and unfortunately we're at a very interesting time in our history where we seem to be doing it again um, I want to just send a incredible, uh, gosh, I, like, I, I feel like I'm at a loss for all of the horrors that we're witnessing on a constant basis, and I try and stay positive, and it's really hard sometimes. Um, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who has spoken up about this horrible issue that we are experiencing at the border of the United States and Mexico right now, where we are basically placing children in custody away from their parents. Um, I know that this is uh, something that everybody is aware of. You cannot possibly be a human being in our country and not be aware of this right now. And I want to thank everyone who uh, has gone out to protest, people who are planning protests on the 30th of June, which is in just a couple days. And basically everybody who's done anything, which is call your senator, call your Congress critters, do anything you can to talk about how this is not okay. Uh, this is like the understatement of the century, I suppose. But uh, I just want to thank people for doing the work and showing up even when it's exhausting. And God knows every day in our country is exhausting. Um, so thank you for everybody who is doing the, the work of resisting. I appreciate you. I see it. And I, I know it's going to be much more of it to come. Uh, but thank you, everyone for working hard to try and prevent these atrocities in the future, and yet somehow we're aware that these cycles forever continue. Uh, I also want to send a beautiful, loving uh, thank you and congratulations and I love you to everyone who is closing out their Pride celebrations at the end of this month. I know that New York just celebrated Pride and San Francisco just celebrated Pride. And so wherever you are, even if you could, did not go to the crush of humanity that was your local Pride parade, or maybe the lack of humanity was that was your very local Pride parade, um, I just want to say I hope that you had a celebration worthy of the word Pride. I hope you were able to step into your sexuality and step into your identity in a way that makes you feel affirmed and loved and connected to community and connected to history in a way that I think is so key. This is the beautiful thing about sexuality because it's so fraught in our society. A lot of times it's devalued. And um, I have a feeling if you're listening to this podcast, you understand that. But I think it's really valuable to remember how much it, how important it is to take pride in all of your identity, including sexuality. Um, unfortunately, often we might learn how to take pride in a lot of different ways, but sex is one of those things we are still considered to be shameful of. But um, I love the idea in every possible way of replace, replacing shame with pride, particularly around sexuality. Being proud of yourself and loving yourself uh, is one of the best antidotes we have to violence and assault and cruelty. So um, step into it, whatever feels good to you. I, I want to thank you for, for showing up and for being wonderful. And I want to thank all of my elders for have fighting the good fight such that I could live in these times where I could be out and feel safe. It's a hard thing to do. And most of the people and throughout history have not gotten that. And many people yet to come have not gotten that and will not get that. But it's always a march towards progress and a march towards more, better, truer humanity. So there you go. Uh, a couple of other little announcements before I get to the interview. So um, I want to thank 
my newest Patreon supporter, Eleanor O'Brien. I know Eleanor from a sex positive art scene. She runs the sex positive theater company and creates a lot of really wonderful opportunities for sex positive artists here in the Pacific Northwest. And her pledge has helped me get to one third of my very first Patreon goal. At $100 a month, I'll be able to get transcripts on every episode. And transcripts will help with accessibility, which is important to me, uh, because there are plenty of hard of hearing people and deaf people who enjoy podcasts. And so transcripts will help them enjoy podcasts even better. And uh, getting transcripts will help me improve searchability on the web so that new listeners can find us. So uh, if you're interested in that, please go check out patreon.com slash artgasm. Uh, Eleanor and my other patrons just got access to my newest patron-only episode where I talk about David Bowie, Marcel Duchamp, and the uses of the erotic in conceptual art. I'm particularly proud of that episode, and I'd love for you to be able to hear it, which you can do by supporting my Patreon at any level. Uh, so you can go to patreon.com slash artgasm to learn more, poke around, see what you like. Um, also, patrons get access to uh, new episodes a, l- a couple days earlier than the rest of the proletariat who are listening on the free forums. Uh, and then also, um, one last announcement about Girl Sex 101. Uh, it's probably going to be my last announcement about these color copies, uh, the fire sale that I'm having on them, because I'm actually almost sold out. I have... Currently, one, two, three, four, five, six. I have seven copies left in my possession. Seven copies of the full color Girl Sex 101. If you want it, if you want one of those seven, uh, go over to girlsex101.com. Do not dilly dally. If they're gone, they're gone. And do not email me and tell me you want one because I cannot send you one. You have to buy it right away. So, girlsex101.com to get the color copies. Um, I know that there's been confusion. The black and white copies will exist in perpetuity. Those are not going anywhere. I am just selling out of the the color ones because my printers raise prices and I cannot afford to continue printing color copies. I don't like that. I wish I could print color copies. Colors really effing pretty. Uh, It's all the colors of the pride rainbow. I really enjoyed the color copies of Girl Sex 101, but yours, if you have one, is about to become a collector's edition because it is no longer being printed. So... Buy your copy ASAP, girlsex101.com. I will sign it. I will send you a sticker. Um, I will, I'm the one who writes the envelopes. I'm the one who takes them to the post office. It is a, it is a labor of love what I do here. It is hand, everything's done by hand, except for like the printing of the books. I didn't print the books by hand, but you know what I mean. Okay. So all of that, um, those are all the big announcements. Yes. Okay. So let's get to the show. So Janet Murray Rogers, like I said, she's an awesome writer. She was a poet laureate. And, you know, I I think I've mentioned on earlier episodes, I'm not much of a poetry person. Um, It's not so much that I don't think it's a beautiful art form. It's just not the first thing that I seek out when I'm looking for to reading material or listening material. But Janet Murray Rogers has kind of helped me change that perspective a little bit. Her work is so accessible. It's very sexy. It's very thought provoking. And I just like her style a lot. And I reached out to her because of uh, she was on the speakers. She was a performer at a, a conference in the Vancouver area for sex educators. And I was like, oh, this person looks interesting. And I reached out to her and she was just a delight to talk to. We had a wonderful conversation. And she I just think she's incredibly talented and an incredibly cool person. Um, If you recognize her voice, it's entirely possible because you've heard her on the radio. She has hosted a number of different radio shows in Canada, including, uh, I think, most popularly Native Waves Radio on CFUV and Tribal Clefts on CBC Radio 1 Victoria. So you might recognize her voice if you listen to public late radio in Canada. She no longer does that, but um, she does a lot of really amazing things. It seems like particularly around the British Columbia area, but I recommend checking her out if you have a chance to see her perform live. I will include, of course, as always, all the links to her various work. Her SoundCloud is definitely a great place to check her out. And so if you want to hear more of her stuff, she does do a little bit of, she does read one of her poems on in the interview, which is great. But if you want to find out more about her, go to artgasmcast.com and you'll see in the show notes all of the linky links to all of her work and all the places you can find her on the online and then listen to her stuff and enjoy so without further ado just as my neighbor starts doing something crazy loud with a power tool of some kind i will introduce you to janet marie rogers janet rogers thank you so much for joining Mm -hmm. me today 
So I found you through a sex positive conference, the ConvergeCon in Vancouver, and you were presenting some of your erotic poetry to the audience there. Can you tell me a little bit about the performance and what you offered them? Yeah. Um, so the conference is called ConvergeCon, and uh, it was the second year that the conference organizers had put this together in Vancouver, and uh, it sounds like they're going to keep going. And when I uh, saw a notice on Twitter for ConvergeCon, um, I got very excited because the dates of the conference and my residency, which I'm currently doing a writer uh, residency in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, kind of like fell into place. And then I saw that their keynote speaker was Kim Tallbear. And Kim Tallbear is, a, is, speaking of podcasts, is uh, someone who I am a huge fan of. And I hadn't at that time met her. And she co-hosts a uh, an, an Indigenous podcast called uh, Media Indigena um, with host uh, Rick Harp. And I'm a huge fan of Kim Talbears because she is hyper, super duper intelligent and uh, very aware. And she practices, she's a practicing um, polygamist or I guess, or poly, poly she, she practices, poly, she's polyamorous. Thank you. And, um, and she does mention that went on the podcast uh, from time to time and she was the keynote speaker. So I thought, oh my God, all of the, all the stars are lining up. And uh, why don't I, you know, they weren't, you know, they, they weren't paying because this is the second year. They haven't really kind of gotten a momentum for this conference yet. And so they're not paying the speakers. And um, that was fine for me because I knew I was going to be in the Vancouver area. And in 2010, I did self-publish a, uh, a, you know, what has become a very successful uh, indigenous erotica book uh, called Red Erotic. So I thought, well, I could probably come and uh, offer to do a workshop and present pieces on the Red Erotica book. But also what, what ended up happening um, for a workshop is I went into indigenous erotica visual art as well. And uh, with a, with a, um, an emphasis on, on the artwork that was produced in the 70s and 80s by Indigenous artists in the territories across these nations. I don't want to use the word Canada, but there again, I just used it. So, um, so that and that's what I did. So there was like a visual component to what I was presenting. And then uh, the two of those artists being Norvell Morceau and Daphne Ojig. And then subsequently, there have been uh, other artists that create uh, Indigenous erotica uh, in their bodies of work, but they don't haven't produced solo exhibitions around indigenous erotica, which I thought was interesting. And there's a need for that. But anyway, uh, so that went on well. And I think people were, you know, they came away learning a lot. Um, and indigenous um, erotica, we always say, this is not new, this is quite old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anything having to do with the, the focus around uh, sexuality and sensuality and, and uh, overlapping into culture, you know, this, these are practices that are quite, quite old. Um, and, and then the other thing that, uh, happened is, uh, throughout the course of, uh, communicating with the, uh, conference organizers, they asked if I would do a performance, uh, in the evening. And so they were having like this party, um, in the middle of the conference. And so I said, yeah, I have two, uh, performance poetry pieces that I could present, uh, that fall right into the theme of erotica. And that's what I did. And the one piece is called on Bay and I do, uh, it's a, it's a pseudo, uh, tobacco, um, um, ceremony performance. Um, and, uh, the song, uh, I sing the song on Bay on a recording and on Bay is, uh, actually it's a Cree word that, uh, it's sung to a double beat hand drum song. And on Bay is like, uh, referencing a time in one's life when you take someone else's hand in trust. And that could be, you know, your parents' hand, your friend's hand, your lover's hand, um, hands in marriage or what have you. And then the other piece I do is called Make Me, and it uh, includes a big, big bowl of honey. And um, <laughs> yeah, then I eventually I come around to uh, spilling out that that oh, honey cool. contents of that bowl into another bowl. So there's no mess. But again, it's it's like these um, new ceremonies, if you will, that celebrate nice. uh, Indigenous uh, sexuality and sensuality. 
So what do you think is unique or special about indigenous erotica specifically? Like, what do you want to communicate to people as they watch or listen to your poetry? Right. Well, you know, there's, um, if people are aware of, you know, the history of residential school uh, with our our, uh, culture and the the attempted eradication of a culture, uh, residential school had like really got us where we live. Uh, the attempts to, you know, um, erase the language, erase the culture, and then basically, you know, uh, kill the Indian within the child to produce these, you know, brown, mm. white people. Um, I want to say that, you know, Indigenous erotica, it's important to uh, speak it, celebrate it, live it, uh, own it enjoy it because that way that's a that's a, a way that we can you know and here's an overused word too that I'm kind of sick of mm-hmm. but decolonize um uh from those those practices and and those events it's a way to reclaim our sensuality and sexuality in good healthy ways and oftentimes i think you know in people's healing because i mean you know we're not even seven generations away from uh, the residential school experience. And so we're still really in the middle of, of this healing, these healing events. Um, if people are looking for permission to do that with their own sexuality and sensuality, then, uh, uh, the red erotic book, uh, the performance art pieces, the, uh, literature, the visual art, all of that stuff gives us permission to be able to reclaim that that part of ourselves and it's a big part of ourselves when you think about it i mean you know native people are gorgeous <laughs> <laughs> and uh we need to participate you know in um in healthy healthy ways because right you know currently we're uh we're, we're, there's a lot of dysfunction within our sexuality as a result of residential school uh disruption and um abuse well, what I like so much about the range of your poetry is that you certainly do capture a lot of the pain and anguish of the history of colonization. But at the same time, you do celebrate a lot of the joy of being a human now and celebrating your body and celebrating sexuality and sensuality, which I think is really refreshing to acknowledge the, you know, we are still here aspect of things that we are still sexual, we're still beautiful, we're still alive. Um, I think it op- offers this healing aspect of art and sexuality itself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, I mean, that's the whole purpose. Yeah. You know, that's the whole purpose. Um, I said to, I, I, you know, when I was speaking to the group at the conference, I told them, I said, you know, this past January, I turned 55. And in my 55th year on this planet, um, I've come to like this wonderful, place of contentment with myself and uh, in all of the aspects of myself and including the my, you know my sexuality um whereas like I'm not even you know I'm not even uh sexually active right now and I'm completely content with <laughs> with that and yet you know I re- was referencing in the workshop again what a fabulous sex life I used to be involved in um and you know I felt very very blessed to be able to experience such satisfying, such um, uh, creative sex, you know, in my life and uh, knowing, realizing that not everybody uh, experiences that, you know, as a, again, as a result of dysfunction, as a result of shame, as a result of all of this colonial interruption. So um, there was just something in me that, that I wasn't disturbed by what uh, my, my own sexuality. And it, it was, again, it was, it was just something that I, you know, I entered the room with. It was, I was very, very sexually active and very happy to be sexually active. How does it feel now talking about finding yourself contented in a less sexual way? How does that make you feel to discover that maybe, you know, I'm not having as much sex, but I'm still very enriched by that lack yeah. of love? Yeah, it was, you know what, it helped me to just kind of refocus myself. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, there's a lot of activity in this world, as I'm sure you're aware, Allison, that, you know, is centered around people getting their groove on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we see it, it's, it's sellable. It's, um, it's every, it's in the media, it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. And, and I mean, you know, that's the reason why we have nightclubs. That's, you know, that's the reason why people go into nightclubs that, you know, all of this, the motivation 
to find and, you know, hunt down that sex is, is it takes up a lot of our time and consciousness and, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you can't deny it. It's almost like golf courses. Like they're, it's damn everywhere. <laughs> it's so funny you say that because I remember as, I think I was probably in puberty when I was really frustrated by the fact that humans didn't have a mating season. I just uh, love the idea of humans just having one month where we just right, got all right. of it out of our system. And then we could spend the rest of the year doing like, you know, more productive things with our time. And what a great idea. And then, and then, you know, and then just all of the communication around around that, again, around the the pursuit of that, uh, is is really takes up a lot of time. And like, there's always miscommunication and on you know unsaid things. And I just, I just like to be in this place of you know, uh, uh, I don't know, not being sexually active. I'm able to see it from, you know, an outsider's perspective. And that's, these are my observations. And so it's almost like I'm going, uh, I'm glad I'm done with that. But, you know, I could be, it could be <laughs> but it could be like, I mean, I'm st- I still see the value in that. And I still see the need to keep these conversations alive for the new generation, the current generation, and any, you know, generations coming up after us so that we, we can, you know, uh, engage in, again, I keep using that word healthy, but, you know, uh, positive ways, and ways that are open and satisfying. And so that we're actually, you know, meeting the needs of our sexuality um, and sensuality and recognizing that that, that is a, a strong part of ourselves and it makes us whole. What I think one of the, mm-hmm. well, my favorite aspect about being in the sex positive community is getting to witness the diversity in the ways that people express sexuality. And yeah. I think what you do that's so interesting with your art is that a lot of your poetry does involve a, a performance component. So it's not just disembodied words on a page. It's that you're having audience members see you living the words that you're you're speaking and, and the ritual aspect that mm. you mentioned that I think adds a interesting dynamic that could be otherwise considered just very straightforward poetry, right. you have a lot of different multi-textual aspects to what you do. I would love to know a little bit more about what you do in your process and the way you present your work, whether with like audio processing. I think you recorded an album. Is that correct? Um, not so much an album. No, uh, just, you know, um, record like just, yeah, recording um, but not around uh, erotica work. But yeah, I do have a, a, a large body of audio poetry that's out there on the SoundClouds. Um, so people can check it out. Yeah. So why don't you share your link, the SoundCloud link? Yeah, it's, it's Janet Marie Rogers Poet um, SoundCloud link. And uh, I've got about three SoundCloud pages. You know, I can't keep up. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of different um, number of different pieces on there that kind of represent the uh, span of, of uh, you know, in terms of time, how long I've been making poetry for. So, yeah. Um, in terms of um, performance, though, I mean, I think uh, the, the erotica work and performance art work, poetry work, um, kind of falls in line with uh, usual performance art practice. And that is, you put your body, you know, out there, you take risks, you involve audience, you do repetition. There's, you know, there's kind of like a checklist, um, uh, that one, if, you know, those who practice performance art, they can go, Oh yeah. Okay. I see. I see. I see how she's followed the, the kind of convention of performance art. And then to introduce, you know, uh, culturally specific elements such as stage, such as, you know, burning medicines, such as, you know, um, uh, tobacco, like I use some, a lot of loose tobacco and I start to, um, sculpt the loose tobacco into words and shapes and things like this. So, you know, there's, there's, um, there's ways that, uh, make the work accessible to everybody. And there's ways that are very specific to indigenous and sometimes specific to my Mohawk uh, heritage. I was actually just about to ask, is this stuff specific to your tribal heritage or is it really more kind of pan indigenous? Well, some of like, for example, like the tobacco I use is from my home, oh. is from my res. So uh, because we have a huge, you know, uh, tobacco industry uh, back on six and they call it, oh, the underground industry. But it's not even underground. There's like everything is out, out front for everyone to see. So, you know, they just try to make it sound so sinister what we're doing. But um, it's just business. And uh, but I make, you know, every time I do get back home, 
I make sure I, I, I get my, my loose tobacco so that I can uh, do things like performance or make offerings on the land, which I do wherever I travel to and, um, you know, make offerings to people if I'm asking them to share their resources with me, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So you're the poet laureate for Victoria, so not actually your home territory. What's right. that like to represent a different area as a poet? Yeah, I was poet laureate for three years, 2012 to 2015. And you know what? I really loved that gig. It was so fun. Like, um, I mean, they knew I, wh- who they were getting. So, <laughs> like, I mean, because it's not something that, you know, you can award yourself. You have like these, you know, uh, municipal entities that uh, committees, if you will, that, you know, kind of vote you in to be this representative. And um, I just I really enjoyed it. I like I respond well to uh, commissioned work. And so oftentimes as the laureate, I was um, asked to write specific pieces and that worked out very well for me. And um, I just liked, you know, kind of having that title. <laughs> and, I, and I was joking because I said, you know, I was joking online and I said, oh, I just wish I had a crown and a sash because it just seemed like such a, you know, this, <laughs> this kind of like oh, grandiose title. And uh, a woman actually from um, uh, uh, Olympia, Washington, she she sewed me a sash, man, and it was it's gorgeous. <laughs> and it's, it has like, this long fringe and it has PL on it for Poet Laureate. And I, I rocked that sash wherever I went it was because it was kind of uh, hilarious you know like I, I didn't take the the position too seriously clearly um but I did I did enjoy it and I, I had a lot of fun I wish I could have done it forever it was so fun that's so cool to hear I mean obviously I've heard of poet laureates but so you've been asked by various organizations to write commission pieces, but what other responsibilities does a poet laureate have? Um, I was obligated to um, uh, organize public events, uh, I think once or twice a year. And, uh, but I did receive a lot of support from the city of Victoria in doing that. Um, like, you know, April, when April rolled around, which it is, you know, uh, it's always national poetry month. And so there was some public events around that and, um, I think I did like a fundraiser. I did a fundraiser for, um, Victoria Reads, which is a, you know, a society that helps people to read and acquire reading skills and books and things like this. So it was, it was all great, you know, and I did it always, you know, from the way that I could live with, you know, I always made sure I included, uh, people of color in my poetry events, which Victoria is a very white city. I don't know if you ever mm-hmm. visited that yes. place, but it's really, really colonial, like Victoria. It's named after Queen Victoria, <laughs> right? British Columbia. Right. So, you know, that was my, um, that was one of my goals was to just, you know, increase the, um, and promote, uh, you know, people of color within these these uh, public events. And that's exactly what I did. That reminds me of something that I wanted to ask you about, because one of the things I find really interesting about the movements in Canada and the territories of Canada is that the acknowledgement of tribal lands in the modern place names. So when people say I'm from, you know, Toronto, but uh, this is colonized from this tribe. And I think it's really cool and I feel like it has not made its way to the United States at all yet. I see it here and there and, uh, you know, with people acknowledging, you know, here we are in the Coast Salish territory, but I feel uh, it's really only right, among right. people who are on the very cutting edge around social justice ideas that acknowledge that and actually do that. Right. I think it's a really beautiful thing to acknowledge the history there. And I certainly appreciated seeing that in some of your bios where you were talking about the modern terms and also the, the, the people who were there before. And I thought that was pretty great. And I certainly hope that America gets on board with that. Yeah. Like when you think about it, it doesn't cost anybody anything to make that acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost you anything, you know? Um, In fact, you know, what it has the potential to do is it helps one to be more aware of the true history of the land where one uh, takes up occupancy or, um, you know, calls home. Um, And then, but then as a, you know, Mohawk person, we say, yeah, that's fine. Land, Land acknowledgements are fine. Uh, it does, it serves that purpose, but let's now talk about, let's move the conversation forward and let's talk about returning some of that land. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So yeah, land acknowledgements are, have been, have been embraced for the most part, uh, across our territories. And, uh, but like, you know, like I said, if you really want to 
um, show some allyship. Let's 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 uh, work together to have some of that land returned. You know, when you talk about Toronto, I mean, that is Haudenosaunee territory. That's my territory. You talk about New York City, that's our territory. Mm. That's cl- definitely our territory. That's where we all started from. And we got pushed up into different territories. So displacement is a really fucked up thing. And it, you know, because because then, you know, people will, will have uh, our arguments or conversations around whose territory it actually is. Mm-hmm. You can say, well, we got, you know, you moved in here at this time and blah, 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 blah. So again, this is just all interference shit, you know? Yeah. So I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your relationship to art and your process, if you don't mind, I'd love to you uh, talk to you more about that. I find poets so fascinating because it's one of those art forms that I really appreciate, but I could not do to save my life. <laughs> so I'd love to know how did poetry itself find you? How did you find it? What about poetry did you feel like this is my art form? This is this is what makes me feel alive. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, place place influences who we are. That's why I think people have these huge, heated, deep-rooted arguments around land. It's because the land it, it informs who we are, it influences who we are, it shapes who we are in all of the other aspects of our lives. And um, with that, I, I can, I can kind of nail down, you know, when I started writing kind of seriously. And that was two years after I moved to the West Coast. So even though as a Mohawk person, I come from um, my territories, which is it now called, you know, Southern Ontario, um, moving to the West Coast in 94, I started writing in 96, I would say has a large part to do with hmm. my being on the coast. Uh, the words were waiting for me here. That's the only, that's kind of one of the ways I describe it because I never dreamed that I would be a writer. I had huh. no aspiration whatsoever to be a writer. And, um, so it was just, uh, I, I came to the West coast as, uh, with a little budding, uh, career as a visual artist, I was painting and taking photographs and what have you. And, but I really struggled with that practice. And then when I started writing, the writing kind of went further in a shorter amount of time and then the, then the visual work ever did. And so I figured, you know what, I better pay attention to this. And, <laughs> and eventually it was, a, it was a, a conscious decision to kind of pursue mm-hmm. one and let the other one go. And, um, and, that's, and that's what's happened ever since. And then as a result of being, um, again, on the West Coast, I came to um, learn about an early writer from my territory from the late 1800s, early 1900s called... E. Pauline Johnson, and she was a half Mohawk. Her mother was English, and she traveled the 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 uh, country, the territories, nineteen times, and she made three trips to the UK to get published. Wow. And so, and then I think about this person because it wasn't so much her poetry that that intrigued me, but it was her her as a woman, her life, because. She, again, thinking back to that time, Mm. living as a single woman, which she was, no children, which she didn't have, and and just traveling, like dedicating her whole life to traveling and touring and bringing her poetry to the people, she friggin' loved it. And so she must have been like this huge curiosity, but at the same time, she was celebrated. And so I kind of look at this woman, I go, holy fuck, this is my literary ancestor, you know? This is, this is who this is whose life I'm kind of it's paralleling um, hers and I'm just going yeah and 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 when I did dip dip in taking it back to you know artgasm uh, when I did kind of try to find bits and pieces about her sexuality and her life and her 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 romantic oh. life oh my god it's oh. like I've yet to find no I've yet to find anything man wow. whatever she was doing it was on lockdown like. <laughs> So far, I'm still looking though, you know, I wanted to, yeah, I, well, I just, I just wanted to like, you know, know what the, what she was all about. You know, I think she, I mean, people kept describing her in these uh, biographies as being completely charming and she had this like low, deep, husky voice and, you know, who the hell knows, right? (laughs) That's one of the fascinating thing about queer history, right? Is that whenever you see anybody in history who wasn't married, who didn't have a traditional gender dynamic with a partner... Right. It's a very modernist perspective, but we can say like that person was totally gay. They, totally gay. Yeah, a lot of our yeah. history was erased. Yeah. And so two women living together without children. Yep. We right. say like, yep. 
And I think yeah, it's kind of a yeah. desperate need for visibility from queer people in certain ways. You know, yeah. in a lot of ways, queer ancestry, we don't have the ability to right. reflect on our ancestors yeah. because their stories were often erased so, as well. So right, we often yeah, want to fill in yeah. the blanks and say, ah, you must be, yeah, you must I be know. your family. Yeah, yeah. Or, se- you know, sexual fluidity. Like, you know, who, mm-hmm. who knows? I Like, the story goes with her anyway is like she was jilted. She was engaged to this banker in Winnipeg. And then, you know, because she was half Native, uh, his family, you know, called it off and she was heartbroken and then I think that's when she just decided you know what fuck Mm -hmm. you I'm gonna I'm gonna go tour the country and watch me watch me and then you know then yeah she started to get published and she was very celebrated so who knows she probably just enjoyed herself who the you know yeah living the life exactly (laughs) exactly to travel that much back then as a woman, uh-huh. a woman of color, as yeah. a single woman, that yeah. sounds radical even now, oh, yeah. let alone back then. That's kind of fantastic. Yeah. In terms of finding other authors, uh, artists, uh, you mentioned Marceau. And I'm sorry, what was the name of the other person? Yeah, Daphne Ojig. Yeah. So, so uh, Norvell Marceau. So tell me what inspiration you find from not necessarily mentors, but other artists. What about their work? do you look for when you seek out other uh, other, other artists for those artists um you know i really like i like the, i like looking back at that time at that era because it was um an interesting time for all in, all native people it was a time when we were really really our consciousness was waking up um there was like politically um artistically all of those things it was a really great time in the 70s and early 80s um uh, and the activism was there and the sexuality was there clearly because these two artists, like, you know, who are grandparents really of, of the contemporary native art movements, they were addressing sexuality. And this was something that was so, uh, different. Like you didn't see it. Usually it was like, you know, the galleries want the native artists to paint the landscapes. They want, you know, they want the fishing pictures. They want the, you know, whatever, and, you know, Norvell so just busted that right open. And he was actually, he's a, like, for real, he's a medicine man. And he's, he's gone. He passed in 2007 um, to spirit. But, you know, in his day, he struggled because, you know, he had all of these spiritual gifts within him. And he was, and yet he lived on the streets. He, he was an alcoholic. He struggled with alcoholism his whole life. But man, man what he did for and native people in terms of like, you know, giving us permission to speak about sexuality and sensuality with his paintings, they were, it, it was, it was this, a new time. It was like, Hey, if Norvell and everybody revered him, even though he had like all these human flaws, it, people really revered him and they figured, Oh, if Norvell is, you know, addressing this, maybe I can address this too. And, and, you know, he was so like cock focused in his in his in his paintings that people are just going oh he's latent gay oh you know or whatever and then um mm-hmm. daphne ojig again a matriarch you know within the contemporary native uh, art movement she was her paintings were more subtle you know they had a much more nuanced mm-hmm. uh approach to sex- sexuality sensuality um uh, so, you know, that's the difference there, but still like, you know, if, again, we were looking to these icons and going, Hey, if they're addressing this, then maybe it's okay to talk about this. So do you recall there being any pushback from like elders or other prior generations to this kind of new ownership of sexuality? Right. Yeah. I can only speak to, you know, what my experience and like putting out this red erotic book, that was a risk. Like Mm -hmm. it really, really was. And even though, you know, and that book came out, like I said, 2010, so eight years ago. And even then, when it first came out, I was so nervous, um, not knowing if this was going to be a career suicide or whatever. Mm. And and I remember I told the story again at this workshop, and I said, you know, when I first brought this book out, the very first time, like soon, very soon after when it was printed, I was presenting at this um, Indigenous writing conference in Peterborough, mm-hmm. Ontario, that territory. And, um, they, I, they, in front of me, the very first row was like this, uh, full row of native elder women. And I thought, holy shit. 
you know, You're in I trouble. Could, it had that potential. And I thought, well, you know what? I, this is, this is it. You got to jump down that rabbit hole. And, um, the first piece in the red erotic book is pr- probably like the strongest piece, like the most like, whoa, piece. Mm. And I thought, I'm just going to do it. And I read the first piece. I took a breath. I looked at this first row of Native women elders and they were laughing their heads ah. off. They loved it so much. Ah. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And, <laughs> but then later there was a woman who, from my territory and she took great offense to my book. Mm. And it was such a, a it was, it was clear by the way that she approached me and she was endeavoring to do it in a very good way. So I give her credit for that. But it was clear that all of the things that she was coming at me with were her things. She goes, I just don't understand all these dildo things, these dildos and da, da, da. And I said, have you read the book? And she goes, oh, no, no, I would never read it. And I said, well, there's no dildos in the book. <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> so, so clearly this was a woman who was you know, very strongly affected by residential school shame and all of that stuff. So, I mean but that was just once. So I, I consider myself like, and it's in its fourth printing. So the oh. success of the, yes, the success of the publication outweighs, you know, anybody's latent kind of, eh, you know, shame, their own shame, internalized sure. shame. Yeah. Well, I'd imagine, again, this is from an outsider perspective, but there's also a lot of, because of the sexualization of non-white right. people. Right in popular culture, there's this concern of like playing into the stereotypes that I'd imagine would happen. And so the rest respectability politics kind of happen <laughs> where people want to keep that stuff on lockdown because they don't want to give an inch to anybody who would use su- people's sexuality for an affair. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's the headdress at Coachella is, uh, yeah. issue. You know, it's, it's, right. it's really very much like that. It's like, don't appropriate, mm-hmm. don't appropriate unless you're from inside and then do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have that. Well, that's something we encounter a lot in sex education, the difference between being sexual and sexualized. Oh, yeah. And one is something that you do for yourself and the other is something that is done to right. you. Right. Good. Yeah. And by being able to put words to it and to, to, and to own your own experiences yeah. is incredibly powerful and it kind of combats sexualization because now we're sharing it from the perspective yeah. of the person themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And I didn't ask you this before before we started recording, but would you be interested in sharing any of your poetry? Yeah, I could do that. Uh, let me find a copy of uh, Red Erotic. Um, I'll read this Sex Shaman Sex Shaman poem. Okay, so Sex Shaman. Sensual ritual lines drawn in the sand Crossed over hand in hand, whale oil light, cast quivering mounds, breach through shadows like newborns on all fours, producing simultaneous tears and laughter, enormous pleasures of extraordinary caliber. Mixing fluids with sap back into blood, pools in eyes easily rise, whispering undetectable dialect, soft suggestions, unable to disobey. Sex shaman songs shared through breath exchange, hyper, ventilate, swoon movement, hypnotic trance, duality dance, sewing sex parts together, sister to brother, versa vice, come by northern light, swollen by southern tonics, beguiled by western darkness, eastern morning brings quiet disorientation, suspended disbelief, relief, skin presence, physical existence, Sweat beads strung, singing, stinging lungs, initiation, incantation, love. Uh, that was beautiful. There we Thank go. you so much. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you yeah. one more question about your process before I let you go. I was reading an older interview mm-hmm. with you, and you had mentioned that that your process for writing is that you were quoted as saying, I wait for the good stuff. And I was curious about yeah. that as it applies to your your role as the Poet Laureate, but also in your external pressures to produce. Do you still, is that still true for you? Do you still wait for inspiration or do you, have you chosen a different path now? Oh, that's a good question. I do, you know, it's, um, I trust, I trust. And that's a big part of it. It's like, um, 
uh, I was just thinking about this today, as a matter of fact, uh, when uh, thinking about, gosh, if if I had written something and um, for someone, you know, and <clears throat> they kind of reject they reject the piece that I produced. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a big flip out because I, I, I trust that I know, and I know, <clears throat> excuse me, that I can, I can create more. Mm-hmm. I know that the, the source will never, um, I, you know, uh, it's, it's almost scary to say it definitively, but <laughs> it, I know that the source is always available to me mm. for, for that. Um, I do work on it. I work on that relationship. I speak to the source, you know, I ask for help. I ask spirit for help. Um, it's, it's, it's ceremony is, is in every part of, of, of life, you know, um, that's my approach. That's really beautiful to hear. And I think it probably gives people listening a little bit of reassurance because sometimes, yeah. I mean, again, it's this very Western idea that we impose around this need to always be be banging our head against something to produce oh, yeah. something, yeah, yeah. as opposed to being able to just listen and witness and receive. Yeah. So I think it's really a healthy, <laughs> responsible yeah. thing. I mean, yeah, I'll, you know, all of the the older what English poets, or whatever, it, it, they always made it seem like oh, they were suffering for their craft. It's like you know what, you don't have to suffer for your craft. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you really don't. I mean, not everybody does you know it's, it's personal but yeah no i think that's absolutely the myth and i i don't, so don't know, understand why we believe that yeah true yeah so i just want to ask you are you still hosting the native waves radio yeah native waves radio gosh i love doing that show i did it for 10 years and actually it was um march of 2017 so last uh year mm-hmm. um i uh left the show it didn't you know i closed the show down i guess you could say mm-hmm. it was community radio but man i love doing that show and you know for 10 years so you had a rapport and a relationship with the listeners and with the you know the people at the station cfuv which was uh, out of university of victoria and um it just i, I just I, I you know i love doing radio so that was a wonderful outlet for me but i knew i was going to be um embarking on all of these residencies and there have been doing like this string of residencies uh, since last fall. And, uh, so, you know, and there's more coming for me this year as well. So I knew because I was going to be out and about in the world and traveling around that I wouldn't uh, be able to kind of keep that up. And, uh, so yeah, I just, I thought, you know what, 10 years, that's a good run. I'm done. And, but every now and then, you know, I'll pick up the the microphone and, and, uh, and, and do a podcast like actually last month or, uh, in February rather, I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the Santa Fe Art Institute and uh, for a one-month residency, and it was an equal justice residency. That was the theme of the residency. And I thought, you know what? I'll make a podcast, and I did. And I'm very, very proud of the work I produced down there. So I do. I keep my foot in the radio you know, door. And, That's great. Uh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah, I find myself, I mean, I'm still very early on in the orgasm process, but I really love it. And it feels nice. creative in a way that I wasn't expecting. And and it gives me an excuse to reach out to people that I would never yes. know otherwise. <laughs> and that's that's the, it's, it's so human, you know, radio is so human. Yeah. Uh, the voice is so like, oh my gosh, like the way people react to sound, it's it's really exciting. And I'm a sound artist too. So I know I know the, the depths and the importance of sound. Mm-hmm. So good yeah, for you. I, I hope you keep enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Thanks. So where can people find you on the interwebs if they want to buy your books or hear more from you? What's the best place to find you? Yeah, I have um, five books and uh, that are out there in the world. They all, I always say each one of my books has a different baby daddy because <laughs> I went with five different publishers. <laughs> but, uh, um, so yeah, there's um, uh, ARP Press in Winnipeg. They published my most recent book, my current book rather, um, Totem Poles and Railroads and uh, Red Erotic. Actually, I I self-produced that one. I self-published that one. So uh, contact me through, you know, the Victoria Poet Laureate 2012-2015 Facebook page. I just don't have websites set up. You know, I just haven't done that. Um, And on the SoundClouds, like I said, so Janet Marie Rogers, Poet SoundCloud and uh, Native Waves Radio SoundCloud. Uh, there's uh, lots of stuff up on that um, page and so on and so forth. You Google me, man. Like I'm out there. Trust me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do recommend that people listen to your SoundCloud because I think that uh, one of the pieces that I was really inspired by was, uh, I think, Touch. Ah, good. 
it was beautifully produced and it felt almost like a song. It had this this kind of slipstream space of being a music, uh, being poetry. And, right. And I think it's a really good introduction for people who don't know if they really like poetry to dig ah, into that because cool. it's very listenable. It's very sexy. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. It's kind of, it's like intersectional. Mm-hmm. That's the word we're using these days. Yeah. Sure, the very inter- it's words. very intersectional in that way because it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, you're right. It's, it, it's, uh, it's poetry, it's song, it's spoken word, it's uh, performance, it's all those things. I love doing that piece, actually. I like it. Okay. That's a piece for men who love men. Oh, I yeah. didn't even catch that. Yeah. I'll have to listen to it again. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Janet Rogers. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to me. I really appreciate pleasure. it. Pleasure. This was a lovely Oh, thanks, Alison. Thank you for doing what you do. It's important. My pleasure. Yeah. And that is it for this week's episode of Artgasm. As always, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for listening. Please, please, please share this podcast. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Leave a review if you haven't left a review. All the things that really help me spread the word of this new baby podcast. I want you to help me help you help other people in all these wonderful ways. And again, over the dulcet sounds of my neighbor's power tools, thank you so much for joining me, and I will be back with you next time. Bye-bye.